Hi and welcome to the Cloaked Hedgehog's YouTube channel. I know there's been a bit of a gap before this video, but that's because I realized it's August and I haven't done much with the summer except produce videos. So I went canoeing and I'm going to show you some pictures from my canoe trip just to make you relax. Here is some water and here we have some more water. And on this one, there's a lot of water. There you go. Now we're all relaxed. Now we can continue to listen to scary dogman sightings. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Wisconsin, which is one of the two states where the modern dogman first emerged. It kind of started with the famous Beast of Bray Road and Linda Godfrey. And Bray Road is in the southeast of Wisconsin. It's a country road, a teeny little country road surrounded by farms, very unassuming. But there was this flurry of sightings in the 80s and 90s and beyond. Linda Godfrey was then working as a journalist for a local newspaper, and she quite reluctantly took on the case of the Beast of Bray Road, which led to more and more and more, and now she is the Queen of Dogmen. Tons of books under her belt. The thing about Bray Road, though, is, yeah, there were tons of sightings, but that doesn't mean that there aren't that many sightings in other areas. It's just these got reported because it was written about, it became known, and it wasn't as shameful to talk about. But the Bray Road Beast wasn't the first one in Wisconsin. There is the Shackleman encounter from 1936, where a man called Mark Shackleman reported a sort of wolfman east of Jefferson, and this wolfman was digging in an old native mound. And it also spoke, in a way. It uttered a word that sounded kind of like Gadara, which actually is a place in the Bible where Jesus threw out demons from a man. But that could be a coincidence. We're not saying anything about that. But the Shackleman encounter wasn't even the first one in Wisconsin. There was, for example, in 1869, a strange-looking animal that was seen by farmers in Janesville. It was described as being very ferocious, and it had fearlessly attacked some large and rough farm dogs. From its appearance, the local farmers suggested that it looked like it was capable of quickly devouring a good-sized boy. The people who hadn't seen it, of course, insisted it must have been a bear, but the witnesses scoffed at this. It was no bear. Anyway, I'm going to read three Wisconsin encounters, and uh, they're not the typical ones. They're quite different. One involves a UFO. One involves actual shape-shifting, and one that I'm going to start with could theoretically have been a Bigfoot, but there are certain telltale signs that point to it being something else. This encounter comes from phantomsandmonsters.com, and it goes like this. This happened to me about 20 years ago. I live in a small lake area called Boners Lake, just outside of Burlington, Wisconsin. At the time of this tale, I lived on the opposite side of the lake of where I live now, about half a mile away from a Boy Scout camp called Camp Odakota. This camp encompasses 185 acres of beautiful rolling hills and woodlands on Dyer Lake. It was a beautiful summer day, and I decided to take a walk with my dogs, a golden retriever and an English setter. I went a different way than usual, and happened upon the back trail to the camp. 
It was chained off, but I chanced it anyway and hopped over to check it out. The trail was very quiet and peaceful, and we walked a while enjoying ourselves greatly. After a bit, we came upon some buildings. One was a large pole barn type that had its doors chained shut. Curiosity overtook me, as usual, and I went up and pushed on one of the large doors, allowing a crack of about six inches. I tried peering inside and couldn't see much but a floor and empty space. I was shocked when an ear-splitting roar came out of the barn. It sounded like a scream, but deep, guttural and bear-like. Well, my dogs took off running, and I took off running after them, terrified. We ran back to my house, and, shaking like a leaf and out of breath, I told my now ex-husband what had happened. He, of course, told me that what I heard was a crane. I just stared at him incredulously. I knew better, but I wasn't going to argue the point with him, and just pondered on it a bit by myself, attempting to calm down. The day went on, and nothing else was said about it until just after dark, when we both heard the same scream coming from the backyard. The house I lived in at the time had a huge backyard. At the very back we had a garden by a small wooded area, and it was from there that we heard the scream. Well, my ex grabbed his rifle and the dogs and headed down to the garden, finding nothing. He came back to the house, eyes wide, and acknowledged that what I'd heard was not a crane. After that, we went about our night talking about it, with the dogs nervously prancing about, and eventually we went to bed. Being summer, the bedroom windows were open, and about 3 a.m. I was shocked awake when it was just outside the window and screaming into it. The dogs didn't even bark, they were just cowering, whining. My husband again jumped up and grabbed the rifle and went outside to investigate, without the dogs as they did not want to have anything to do with it. Again he found nothing. Well, the story would end here as we didn't hear anything after that, and I was too scared to investigate the building again. But it just happened that about three weeks later, my husband and I went away for the weekend on a camping trip, and my mother younger sister and her two daughters spent the night at our house to watch the dogs while we were gone. The following morning, my sister was in the kitchen cooking breakfast when my niece Sandra came in. She looked at the kitchen window and noticed a long smear mark on it. She was about nine at the time and looked up at my sister and said, I know what did that. My sister looked at it and asked Sandra what she thought made it. Sandra replied, Oh, it was a swamp monster. My sister chuckled and asked her why she thought that. Now, I was always teasing the girls with stories about a swamp monster that lived out by me, so they just knew that there was a creature out there. This, of course, was before my own experience, and it wasn't cute and funny anymore. Then she said, I saw the swamp monster last night. My sister said, still chuckling, Oh, what did you see? Sandra just looked at her and said, I saw a huge, white, hairy arm, and it ran its claws across the bedroom screen. My sister said, Wow, what did you do? Sandra said, Oh, I just rolled over and went to sleep. I knew it was Aunt Tina trying to scare me. Of course, we were camping. So what did she see? I haven't a clue to this day, but I wonder were they keeping something out there? Or was that thing living in that barn unbeknownst to them at the camp, and did it follow me home? Last summer, my brother, sister-in-law and I tried going back there, but we got stopped by the person living across the road before we could go across the chain that is still there. One more thing about the camp. Before this situation, a group of us had gone in the front entrance to the camp by car to check out Dyer Lake that is at the center of the camp, hoping to sneak in some late night swimming. 
This was of course after dark, and we of course were not supposed to be there. We arrived at the trail to the lake and got out of the car with our flashlights to walk. We tried following the trail, but ended up going off somewhere along the line. We went over a hillside and there, at the bottom of the hill, was a beautiful wrought iron gate about six foot tall. There was a hole dug into the side of the hill and this gate was covering the opening. We opened the gate and found ourselves in a 12 by 12 foot cave of sorts. Inside were candles, a dead rooster and a scythe. There was nothing else, no altar or other signs of occult practices, just the things we found haphazardly laying about the room. My sister's now ex-husband took the scythe, which I told him to leave there, and we left and never went back. That is, until I went for my walk that summer day. That is, until I went for my walk that summer day. Hmm. This is a strange story. It could be that the creature in question was a Bigfoot. But I don't think it was. Because one, it followed her home. Which Bigfoots can do, sure. But dogmen especially are very known to do that. And most importantly, it had claws. Bigfoot doesn't have claws, it has nails. It had a claws that it ran across the bedroom screen window. Nah, I think this was a dog man. And that last part, with the weirdness in the cave, eh, that makes me think skimwalkers. But, I don't know. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> this next story comes from beforeitsnews.com and it's it's interesting for two reasons. One, because there seems to be an association here with UFOs, and two, because of something called the Oz Factor, or Oz Effect. Here we go. Greg Posada and Eugene Pointer of Shawano County, Wisconsin, called the paranormal hotline with a report of two werewolves seen near Grass Lake on January 9th, 2013. They claimed that these two creatures that appear to be werewolves were definitely bipedal. One of the creatures had grayish hair while the other had brownish hair. Both creatures had snouts. When the creatures were observed, they both seemed to be bent down drinking water from the lake. Eugene and Greg both claimed that the creatures sniffed the air and then turned and looked at them. They let off a howl that sounded like a regular wolf and ran off into the nearby thickets. The encounter occurred around 1400 hours, and Eugene and Greg were both shaken from this encounter. Greg says that the brown-coated creature was at least 7 feet tall, while the grey-coated one was perhaps 6 feet tall. Eugene says that this is not the end of the story. After their encounter with the werewolves, it was no more than 10 minutes later that they spied a silver disc in the surrounding forest. The silver disc was hovering, tilted, and then shot up into the sky. The sighting of the disc lasted only about three minutes, but during the time of the sighting, everything felt surreal. Everything moved in slow motion. Eugene and Greg felt relaxed and at ease while they watched the disc in the sky. Eugene does not understand how they could have two paranormal encounters in one day. This surreal effect that they were talking about is called the Oz Factor, or the Oz Effect. It was invented by a person called Randalls in 1983 to describe the strange and seemingly altered state of consciousness experienced by some witnesses of unidentified flying objects. I have to mention something, a personal note. <laughs> For some absurd reason, I mean, I have studied ever since I was a kid, ever since I was five, I have devoured everything weird I have managed to, to read. Actually, my motivation to learn how to read came from the fact that 
Strangely, adults wouldn't read everything to you that you wanted to know, and I just had to know. So I was very motivated to learn how to read, and I started reading around the age of five. And whenever I could, I read stuff I wasn't supposed to read, <laughs> and it has continued ever since. And I've done the ghost stuff. I have done astrology and numerology. I've done tarot, even though that was so definitely not for me. Um, I I've studied everything within this field, except one one thing that. <sighs> I don't know why that particular area is. I wouldn't say uninteresting. It's not uninteresting to me. But it, it's uncomfortable. I don't like it. I don't like UFO stories. I have never been particularly into UFOs and stuff. I don't know what it is about UFOs. They creep me out in a completely different way than the dogman does. Uh, sure, dogman is <laughs> freaking scary, but. UFOs, it's just so... I don't know if it's just because I feel this way about UFOs, but I am actually kind of stalked by UFOs. I don't want to see them, but I see them a lot. I don't understand how people can say, oh, I want to see a UFO. How can you not see a UFO? I'm, I can be lying on my bed with the windows open and look out and I'll see something. That isn't a satellite or anything that I can explain. I've always been very interested in astronomy and stuff. I know what a bolide is. I know what a meteorite looks like. I know what a satellite looks like. And I, <laughs> I keep seeing stuff that are not normal all the time. And I don't want to. And this particular story that I just read, well, they talked about this silver disc that was hovering and tilted and then shot up into the sky. That reminds me a heck of a lot about the last one that I saw, which was just a few months ago. And I was just, again, not trying at all. I went to my bedroom window, which was open. I looked out. I looked to the right, which is, well, north, northwest. And there was this thing wasn't silver, it was more white, and the sun was almost completely down, but the sky was kind of red in that direction, and this thing was so white, and it looked kind of like an oval that was on its side, tilted, and I thought, could it be a plane with the condensation coming out, or I don't know what it was. I was looking at that for a while, and it was just standing there. I was I was just looking to see if it moved. But I looked at it for, I don't know, half a minute. And it didn't move at all. And then I went inside to get the camera. <laughs> and of course, it took maybe seven seconds. And it was completely, completely gone. It could not have been a plane. It wouldn't have disappeared that fast. It was just gone. The largest one was a bloody mothership thing that I actually saw above an old abandoned factory once. There was a, a lake in between me and that abandoned factory, and I saw something that looked like the motherships from the old 80s TV show V. It looked like that, and it was just hovering above this. It was huge. But uh, it's also so weird that I... I'm not sure if I actually saw it or dreamt it. I mean, but I can still I can still picture it clearly in my head. And I was maybe 14 by then. But this has nothing to do with dogmen as far as I know. So <laughs> maybe I should stop yapping now and move on to the next story. And this next story is weird if you have a problem with the shape-shifting part. It is, but I don't. I also linked to this story in, I think it was in the Crash Course Part 3 video. Huh, I don't know, but it was one. But I didn't read it, so now I'm going to read it. It comes from CryptoZoologyNews.com. 
end, it goes like this. Skipping the intro here. That day, I went out earlier than usual in the morning. It was 5 a.m. when I grabbed my backpack, consisting of one sandwich, botanical books, and a notebook and a pencil. I like carrying my shotgun as well, even though it gets pretty uncomfortable after a while, but I do bring it with me every time I go out to the woods. My day was pretty productive, and I drew a few plans on my notebook, but it was after 8 a.m. that I realized I forgot to bring water with me. That was a huge mistake. But I know a little source of water, a spring nearby that carries clean, drinkable water. I decided to go there. Once I reached the spring, I was relieved to see the clean water flowing through it. I left my backpack on the ground and bent over to drink some of it off my hands. I was very thirsty and I drank as much as I could. As I stepped back from the water and reached for my backpack, I heard a strange sound that reminded me of a howl, only it sounded like a creature in pain and not like a wolf trying to communicate. I didn't pay much attention to it, since you can hear about anything here in the woods if you concentrate hard enough, so I decided to head back home. On my way back, I began to think, what if that howl was actually a person asking for help? What if I ignored the cries of a human being crying to be heard? That's what made me go back to the spring. I started blaming myself for not having thought about this earlier and thinking about how that person could be dead by now. It could have been a hunter or an old person. When I got to the spring, I stayed still nearby, trying to hear the sound again. I screamed out, asking to see if anybody was there. I went around the spring in circles, looking for this person, hoping to find someone laying on the floor. I was kind of relieved. Maybe, after all, it was just an animal howling or some tree branch making a funny crackling noise. I called again, just in case. Nothing. Not a sound. Only the water flowing down the rocks. I became hungry, so I sat down next to the water to eat the sandwich. Again, kind of relieved that it had only been a false alarm. But it hadn't been a false alarm. I dropped half of my sandwich on the water. The howl happened again, only this time it was more of a human cry. No doubt it was a male human crying out loud. An adult. A very loud cry. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I started running towards the sound. Hold on, I'm coming. You okay? All I could see was the branches of bushes and trees hitting me on the sides of the face and scratching my arms. Then I saw it. It was there, sitting down in the middle of an opening, a human-like figure. It then started moving fast, movement that I've never seen in a human, almost like spasms, only faster, shakier. I realized it wasn't a he. But an it. It stood up on its hind legs, and I could see the outside of the body was hairless, like a human, whereas the inside was hairy, like an animal. It was silver hair, white. Its chest was full of it. No sexual organs anywhere. The head started to take shape. It had two distinctive wolf-like ears and a long snout. Long canines showing up on the sides up and down like a hog. The eyes were brown or black, very dark. It then growled, and I have to admit, I was pretty freaked out by then. I reached for my shotgun, not to shoot it, but to scare it away with a shot in the air, when I realized I had left it back at the water spring. I was defenseless and standing next to a creature I had never seen before. I thought if I started running it would chase me down, so I stood still, quiet, trying not to stare into its eyes so it wouldn't find me challenging as dogs often do. That's when it approached me. 
close enough to smell it. It put its snout up on my head and sniffed my eyes and my nose. Its eyes connected with mine and I wasn't able to gaze away this time. I could feel its pain. The creature was in pain, but also you could feel its anger. I couldn't stand it anymore and I started screaming. It then left, running on four legs. I urinated my pants, literally, I did. I was surprised it didn't have a tail and the rear end looked like a human butt, to be honest. I stood there for a few minutes, making sure it had left for good. Then I went back to my backpack and shotgun and headed home. It was the weirdest day of my life. Yeah, this is a strange story, especially if you don't acknowledge that shape-shifting might actually happen. But um, there are actually other stories if you look for them. And it's of course up to you whether you believe it or not. Well, that was it for Wisconsin. There might be another episode of Wisconsin in the future, depending on a few things. But this was it for now. Be safe and take care, and I'll see you next time.